again this year, I have the pleasure of uh, presenting and introducing the key, one of the key speakers. Uh, General Shelton, commander of the Air Force Space Command. Most of you have had the, all, the opportunity to read his bio uh, in our material that we provided to you. So I'm not gonna dwell on those, necessarily those points that are in there, but I would like to uh, give you some information that you might be surprised to learn and understand about General Shelton and his career. The first thing that struck me was that in 35 years he's moved, he's moved and had 23 different jobs. Now some of you might say, gee whiz, he can't hold a job. <laughs> but of course, if you've worked with General Shelton in any way, shape, or form, you understand uh, that the Air Force has realized his capabilities, experience, and potential for higher level jo jobs and responsibilities. He, he is also very unique in that he is the only United States general officer today in the Air Force that has had the level of a operational experience that he has from squadron to commander of the 14th Air Force, the first joint force component commander for Space Command, and now today the commander for Air Force Space Command. This would be his fourth appearance before you, and what's significant about this is the effort he's made to be with us today, as, as Jeannie pointed out. It's hard to believe that in just a, a day and a half of time, he will have traveled from Colorado Springs, visited with you last night, or delivered us the keynote address, and get on an airplane to be in Washington, D.C. for an 11.30 meeting tomorrow with the House Armed Services Committee. It wouldn't be surprised if yesterday or the day before he would have called and said, you know, this is kind of tough. I think I'll pass on that. But that's not General Shelton's way. And so we're really pleased that he recognizes the value and contribution that you all make to this conference and that he, and too, he too wanted to contribute with it. So please welcome General Shelton. Thank you. I'm falling apart a little. Kirk, thanks for that gracious introduction and uh, hello to all of you. It was uh, certainly great to hear from Senator Inouye, uh, his kind welcoming remarks. And I'd like to thank him not only for his support to this conference and to this mission area for so many years, so influential in this community, but also for his long service to the nation as a member of the greatest generation. So another round of applause, if you would, please. It's always great to be here on the beautiful island of Maui. You know, a lot of people ask me, why are you traveling all the way to Maui to speak at that conference? <laughs> to me, that question kind of sorts those who have been here and those who haven't. You know? <laughs> the last time I was here, which I think was 2008, I made a joke about all the Aloha shirts in the crowd, made some crack about colors not seen in nature or something like that. And it really didn't go over all that well. <laughs> so I decided today I wouldn't make any jokes about the shirts I see from here. <laughs> I didn't see you come in, but I sure heard your shirt. <laughs> OK, stop. Sorry, <laughs> couldn't help myself. Just jealous because I don't have one on, I guess. But back to a much more professional level, if we could. Uh, I believe that this is the premier technical conference for space situational awareness in the world, and that's why I'm here. Those of you in this room are important contributors to what I consider a vital part of this nation's security. My goal here this morning is to give you enough insight into where we are going that you'll be able to know how to dovetail into what we're doing given your particular corner of the world. I guarantee you, I don't know all the details of all the projects that you're working on, but I can also guarantee you that we're trying to widen the tent to help achieve our objectives. And my instincts tell me that we may reach our objective in objectives in ways that none of us could imagine right now, 
and hence the wider tent. As you know, in only a few short decades in the SSA community, we've moved from a cataloging mentality to a rudimentary ability to predict events in space. We're now looking toward systems that confuse information to produce real-time, cross-domain, predictive, and assured situational awareness in both cyberspace and space. And along those lines, my intent is to move, continue to move, from cataloging toward actionable knowledge in the space surveillance or space situational awareness area. It was only a little more than a half century ago that we had only one satellite to track, Sputnik, and a bunch of smart people like you quickly figured out the orbital parameters well enough that they were regularly published in the papers so that people could go outside and watch it fly over. I'm not quite old enough to remember Sputnik, in fact, the older I get, the less I remember about what happened yesterday, much less 50 years ago. But I do remember watching some of those old grainy black and white early launches, and frankly, it was part of the spark that got me into this business. But now, instead of just one satellite, we're literally tracking thousands of objects. To track these objects, we use a wide variety of sensors, sensors optical, radar, and others. But until just a decade or two ago, almost everything we did supported the primary goal of cataloging objects. We wanted to know where in space and when in time these objects were. If one didn't show up at a sensor as expected, we'd then start a methodical search to try to figure out what had happened, largely based on, for the first several hours anyway, on where it should have been. We've developed a framework for this process that consists of four major functional components associated with SSA. What I've just described is the most basic, detect, track, and identify. Today we do a good job of accomplishing this objective, but we still need to do better. I'll discuss some of the improvements we plan to feel along these lines shortly, but the bottom line is that the de detect, track, and identify is the bread and butter of our current SSA program and it's reasonably well understood. However, you'll note that almost this entire process is reactive. We only notice something has happened when an object is newly detected or when it doesn't show up when our propagation algorithms say it should. Once we found the orbiting object, the next step we take is related to our second SSA thrust characterization. This thrust uses a host of phenomenologies, including resolved and non-resolved light curves, curves, polarimetry, direct imagery, diffraction pattern analysis, and many others to not only let us know that the object is there, but what it's made of, what it looks like, even whether it's operating as expected. We use change detection to see if all the satellite's parts are still intact when we last, since we last imaged it. I personally find it amazing how far and how fast this field has progressed since I first became aware of it early in my career. I've looked over the conference program and note that, as expected, a large portion of the talks are exactly on this subject. Lieutenant Colonel Hans Thatcher uh, of my requirements directorate will discuss the SSA network later on today. I have to take my hat off to all of you in this room who have done so much to squeeze exploitable data out of relatively tiny specks of light flying across the sky. I know there is much more magic coming in the next few decades, but even with all this magic, frankly, what we're doing in characterization is still too reactive for me. Perhaps the hardest task we have ahead of us, though, is contained in the third SSA component, data integration and exploitation. Right now, we receive huge amounts of SSA data, but it is not easily correlated, and it's very difficult to fuse all that data into a single, comprehensive picture usable by our space operators in near real time. The primary place in the military where this thrust is being accomplished is the Joint Space Operations Center, the JSPOC. Colonel Mike Wasson will be speaking more in detail about processing in the JSPOC later, later at this conference, and I'll discuss the future of the JSPOC in detail in just a few minutes. The JSPOC necessarily has many systems, unclassified and classified. But the system that's slowing us down the most right now is the venerable Space Defense Operations Center computer, better known as SPADA. This machine crunches through all the observations from the sensor network and spits out the element sets of all the cataloged objects. 
This system is well beyond its design life. The data intake is almost at its red line. And the current software is almost old enough to vote. No kidding. The sneaker net is another killer for us. That's the current manual way of moving data of different standards and dis different class classification levels to various integration and processing machines in the JSPOC. It's also the only way to ingest data from other sensors, such as missile defense radar, radars and non-DOD telescopes. Probably some of you are snickering inside, but this is no joke. Our system is woefully out of date. And the good news here is that any improvement would be a quantum leap forward. And it's data integration exploitation and exploitation that's going to help us move from reactive to predictive capability. We'll need to accomplish the fourth thrust in the SSA framework, which is threat warning and assessment. Threat warning is inherently predictive in nature. Some threats undoubtedly will be intentional acts, such as anti-satellite launches or maneuvers, and because of this, we need to be able to explicitly determine, to the best of our ability, the intent for every launch and for every maneuver. The sensor inputs from the existing SSA network can, in many cases, give only a few minutes notice of these kinds of threats. For earlier warning, we'll have to likely turn to other intelligence sources, and I know a lot of you are working this hard right now. Other threats will be the result of unintentional events. We can no longer accept the big sky theory as our de facto course of action. A high accuracy catalog with the ability to run all on all conjunction analyses as far into the future as our sensor accuracy will allow is now absolutely essential. Obviously, both for intentional and unintentional threats, earlier warning is better. The commander of JSCC space deserves all the decision space we can give her. This calls for unprecedented levels of predictive capability, data fusion and intelligence, and all underpinned by adaptive sensor management. The second part of this last SSA component is assessment. We need to be able to attribute actions to their causes, whether natural, natural or intentional. We need to be able to do the forensics to determine how and why. Being able to take action to negate threats and having the information available to assess incidents to attribute their causes are excellent examples of actionable knowledge. It is the end result of fusing and exploiting the data that come from our detection, tracking, identification, and characterization sensors and systems. So that's the SSA framework that we're operating under now and for the foreseeable future. I think it's a good framework for discussion because it gives us a rough idea of how the problems can be categorized and attacked. But I'd like to turn now from the framework to implementation of SSA. As I already said, we use a number of different sensors to contribute to our knowledge of orbiting bodies. Some are quite old, like the space fence. And we're in the process of changing that system from VHF fixed antennas to S-band phased arrays, increasing its versatility and sensitivity many-fold. Linda Haynes, our uh, Electronic Systems Center program manager, is here, and she will talk to you more about that later. But we are really excited about what the space vents will do for us in the future. The newest of our SSA sensors is the space-based space surveillance system, SBSS. It's an optical vacuum cleaner that's doing great things for us, keeping a watchful eye over deep space. Launched about a year ago, we are now finishing the operational acceptance process. We've worked through a few problems with that, both on the ground and in space. With, with the space fence of the future doing a great job sweeping up the near-Earth regimes and SBSS tracking the deep space objects, will be absolutely awash in data flowing into the JSPOC. Now, this is a great problem to have, but it speaks again to, it speaks again to the need to get off that dinosaur called SPADOC. After looking at the early results coming from SBSS, I'm convinced that we really need to sustain SBSS-like capability on orbit for the long term. You'll hear more about SBSS from the Space and Missile Systems Center's program manager, Lieutenant Colonel Steve, Steve Bame, on Thursday. Of course, here at Amos Conference, I can't uh, forget to mention those great telescopes on top of Haleakala. 
Not only is it one of the largest optical systems in the Department of Defense, it's one of the most versatile as well with its innovative design that allows its light to be channeled to various experiments. This system is one of the world's leading sites for the advancement of our characterization thrust for SSA as well. And I can't say enough about the work for the, uh, of those who uh, work, those here today who work at the Maui Space Surveillance System. And when the data is linked to the High Performance Computing Center down the hill, well, it's a marriage made in heaven as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely superb results. There's another big telescope that's uh, currently being demonstrated as a DARPA project the Space Surveillance Telescope. Now, it's got a curved focal plane array that enables a much larger field of view than conventional optics. DARPA will turn that telescope over to us once the demonstration is complete. And I'll tell you, if I had the resources, I'd put three of those around the planet because there is so much volume of collection capability and an ability to pick up small and dim objects just about anything out there in deep space. First light on that telescope was on the 15th of February this year, and we should get it for operations in uh, late next month. It's a truly great system, and as I said, we're hoping in the future to be able to afford more of them. Now, I'm well aware that the primary purpose of this conference is to discuss the first two thrusts of the SSA framework, the detect, track, and identify thrust, and the characterization thrust. The sensors I just discussed are only a few examples of the many we use to piece together what's going on in the 73 trillion cubic miles surrounding the Earth out to GEO. I firmly believe that these sensors that feed into our system will continue to evolve and remain an extremely important part of SSA. However, the revolutionary future of SSA lies primarily in the data integration and exploitation thread of our SSA framework. I've already talked all around this subject, so now let me take this head on. The JSPOT mission system, or JMS, is where this revolution will become reality by incorporating many disparate, traditional, non-traditional, and emerging sensor inputs to produce the relevant, actionable intelligence, or knowledge, rather, the, the commander of JSCC space needs. Major Mike Morton will speak in detail about JMS later today, and I hope I'm not stealing too much of his thunder here by talking about JMS, but I'm really excited about what JMS will do for our SSA capability after an interminable wait. Interminable. As we envision it, JMS will automate many of the tasks we do today manually and will fuse the best available information on the fly. Remember the sneaker nets in the current JSPOC I talked about earlier? Gone. Excessive delays in posting of our sensor observations? Those will be gone too. JMS will include decision support tools so our space operators have the information they want when and where they need it to help make them make the best decisions possible. I know JMS will help move us from a reactive posture to, pr to a predictive one. Let's face it, space is not intuitive to most of us, even for some of us who majored in astro. Without the help of machines, we can't anticipate events and take the appropriate action, actions to make them play out in our favor. I'm so enthusiastic about JMS because I think we're finally on course on glide slope. So how will JMS do all these great things? How will it usher in this revolution? JMS is based on a service-oriented service -oriented architecture, very open architecture. Apps, applications will be plug and play and we'll procure them just that way. If we like them, we'll keep them. If a better idea comes along, we'll throw away the old application and plug in a new one. This is an equal opportunity system for software developers. Gone are the days of tightly integrated proprietary software. This will be a new environment that is flexible and extensible. And that brings up an important point. JMS doesn't just have to be displayed in the JSPOC. In fact, if you're an authorized subscriber, you will able, be able to see the data from just about anywhere, from the unclassified level to the highly classified levels, depending on what you're cleared for. Colonel Steve Butler, my SSA and command control lead, will be part of a panel discussing SSA collaboration later today, or I'm sorry, on Friday. 
Earlier, earlier I discussed how a lot of the data fusing currently done in the JSPOC is, at best, manual. It takes a lot of the operator's time to go through all the sneaker nets and air gaps. Much of it, really, is just gray matter fusion. An individual's brain performing what fusion machines could do so much easier. Such a situation doesn't leave a lot of time for the operator to analyze. One of the revolutionary parts of JMS will be that the operators will start with a product that has already been fused. That's a product the operators can really work with. We'll move from a mentality of what does it mean now to one of what will it mean for me in five days. That's a definite move from being reactive to more predictive. But it will require a big change in how we train our operators as well. They'll have to move from the realm of checklist operators to flexible and creative operators. Now, that's not to say we're going to throw away our checklists. We'll find a way to marry up checklists and creativity so that our operators aren't constrained beyond the inherent value in a very flexible JMS. I talked about JMS presenting the best available information to our space operators. Well, currently, we have multiple sensors at multiple locations around the world feeding information into what amounts to a synchronous operations and intelligence network. Some of the time, characterization can be done on the fly in real time as observations come in. However, most of the true characterization work is done by our superb intelligence community at places like the National Air and Space Intelligence Center at Wright-Patterson. Now, I'm not saying this is a bad thing because NASIC does absolutely great work. But what if the JMS could fuse that data in such a way to get the characterization job done in the JSPOC in real time, at least for much of the time? What I really want out of JMS is to develop even more of a warrior mindset for my, for my space operators. When fighter pilots, just as a comparison, when fighter pilots see a target show up on their heads up display, there are times when they just need to react. They have to shoot or be shot. As perhaps a silly example, the HUD doesn't withhold information from the pilot until it is determined exactly what kind of aircraft it is seeing or it is, it is seen by sending all the radar, IR, and other information into an intelligence system for analysis. It shows the pilot the target. Granted, there are times when a space object may be a brand new item and further analysis is absolutely required before action should be taken. But that's an example of person on the loop decision making, a key attribute of JMS. The operator gets to make the decision rather than the current process preventing him or her from having the complete picture available to enable a decision. By the way, not all sensors will link into JMS uh, need to be related to uh, orbiting objects. For example, we'll have access to sensors related to space weather. Should we detect a large solar flare from a JMS registered space weather sensor, we'll be able to rapidly predict its effects on not only the satellites we're tracking, but on the Earth's atmosphere as well. We'll then be able to provide that input into the daily air tasking order, the space tasking order, and the cyber tasking order to highlight potential communications and navigation degradations. The SOA environment will also allow many more non-traditional SSA inputs, things running the gamut from cyber sources to missile defense sensors and even to university telescopes. All of these posted sources would have to be uh, have to be verified, validated, but imagine how powerful it could be to have these various data sources filling in gaps in our capability. Now, I've talked for quite some time now on JMS because it really is a game changer for the SSA community and really the entire space community at large. It does not diminish what we're doing in the sensor field. The multi-phenomenology fusion that JMS enables will mean that we'll significantly improve our capability to characterize what we see around the planet, and it even gets better with improved sensors. It will lead to the delivery of that relevant, actionable knowledge that is so important in our line of work, knowledge that is real-time, cross-domain, predictive, and assured. We'll have a much better handle on threat warning and assessment because of JMS's revolutionary improvement to data integration and exploitation. 
To reiterate, as space becomes even more important to our nation, SSA has become a key contributor to our national defense. Now let me put this more succinctly for this crowd. SSA underpins everything we do in space operations, everything. From launch collision avoidance to conjunction analysis to space control to routine satellite ops, it all hinges on robust SSA. And as our nation becomes more dependent on space, as well as uh, on space for day-to-day -day activities and warfighting, we must have a corresponding increase in our ability to provide SSA to the commander of JS JFCC space. To me, an admittedly biased member of the choir, the logic for a vastly improved JSPOC is inescapable. And JMS is the horse we will ride. And we will continue to improve our sensing capability as well. SBSS, SST, a new space fence, all are essential elements of our quest for the leap from catalog maintenance to actionable knowledge. Hang with us. We're on course and on glide slope. Mark Twain once said, action speaks louder than words, but not nearly as often. I appreciate you listening to my words today, but it's more important that you, are, you see our actions over the next several years. Thanks to all of you for your personal contribution to the important business of SSA, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much.